Today we're going to go over cervical spine somatic dysfunction diagnosis and um, basic palpation skills to orient yourself to where you are in your cervical spine. Uh, first things first, we want to make sure that when we're sitting at the head of the table that our patient is comfortable, that we're comfortable, that the table is at an, an appropriate height and that our chair is at an appropriate height. Um, we're going to have our patient uh, lift their head. Go ahead and lift your head. And uh, for females, uh, definitely sweep the hair out so you kind of clear uh, where the neck is. Go ahead and drop your head down. Good. Um, also, you want to make sure that you're very clear with your patient about what you're doing and where your hands are going to be. So I'm going to be uh, putting my hands along your neck, and I'm going to be pushing from side to side, pushing on a couple different spots. Um, if anything is tender, let me know. And if anything is uncomfortable, let me know. Okay. And uh, do I have your permission to examine you? Yes. Perfect. All right, so uh, first we're going to make uh, initial contact and um, bring your hands uh, from the sides here. And you can make contact with the cervical paraspinal tissues. And then from here, uh, we can orient ourselves to where the midline is by finding the spinous processes. So bringing our fingers up to the midline, we can find the spinous processes. And then our next uh, step is going to be to find either the top or the bottom of the cervical spine. So we can find the top of the cervical spine by finding the occiput. And then underneath you'll find the C2 spinous process. That's, that's the first spinous process you're going to find. It's a, a nice uh, big prominent bifid process. Um, and then you can use that to orient yourself and uh, step down spinous process by spinous process. Alternatively, you can come down uh, to C7 and T1, and you're going to find C7 by finding the most prominent uh, spinous process uh, at the base of the cervical spine. And then you, you could then orient yourself and uh, work your way superiorly and uh, trace your way uh, up to the top. Uh, once you've figured out the bounds of where you're going to be, uh, your next challenge is going to be to find uh, your landmarks for palpation so that you can induce motion uh, in a segmental fashion. So just lateral to the spinous processes, you'll find the, you'll find the paraspinal muscles. Um, the paraspinal muscles uh, are going to provide a little bit too much tissue and are not really going to allow you to palpate um, uh, motion well at the segmental level. Um, and if you come too far lateral, uh, you'll end up where the transverse processes are, but in the cervical spine, the transverse processes are much smaller and are going to be covered by a lot more muscle, uh, both the sternocleidomastoid and also the scalenes. Um, so what, what you want to do is you want to find the space in between those anterior muscles and the paraspinal muscles where you can uh, sink in and find uh, very, very clear bony landmarks, and those landmarks are going to be the articular pillars. Once you've uh, contacted the articular pillars, you can then engage in uh, motion testing on a segmental level. So I'm going to orient myself to figure out which uh, segment I'm going to be at. So starting from C2, sorry, starting from C2, then moving down to C3 come lateral to the articular pillars. So this would be articular pillars of C3, articular pillars of C2. So as I'm finding the articular pillars, what I can begin to do is I can begin to translate, which means um, bring the cervical spine from side to side, each segment one by one, uh, to test uh, different uh, ranges of motion at each segment uh, and test freedoms, of bar freedoms and barriers. And what I'm looking for is in any area of significant restriction or significant uh, motion asymmetry. And actually the C3 area right here is where I'm finding the most asymmetry. So when I translate to the left, I'm inducing side bending to the right. So when I do that, I'm finding that I have good motion. And when I try to side bend to the left, or when I try to translate to the right, I find that uh, I hit a bit of a barrier and I'm not able to move past the midline. So that suggests that um, I have a freedom of motion in right side bending and a barrier of motion in left side bending. Now for, for the cervical spine, 
uh, we're not going to worry about Friet's principles. And for C2 to C7, uh, we're always going to acknowledge that side bending and rotation are going to move in the same directions. So for C3, where I am, if I am detecting a side bending preference in right side bending, then that would mean that my freedom of motion would also be in right rotation. So what I can do to also confirm and evaluate that motion, that rotation motion, is pair my translation or side bending with rotation to that level. And what I want to what I want to do is try to be careful with um, with really focusing my motion at that level and not trying to include uh, segments above or below because then it will skew my uh, my impression of that motion. If I was to move a little bit too far, then I moved well beyond um, C3 and I'm moving down into the lower segments. So I begin with side bending or translation, and then I can also induce or add a little bit of rotation uh, to couple with that side bending. And that confirms that I have more restriction when I translate to the right, which is side bending to the left, and I try to rotate to the left. I hit a bit of a barrier, and when I translate to the left, which is side bending to the right and rotation to the right, I encounter a freedom of motion. Now I want to repeat this in both flexion and extension. So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to straighten out that cervical lordosis to induce flexion, and then I would test that translation again. And what I'm finding is a bit of resistance in both directions. And when I extend, so enhance that cervical lordosis, emphasizing that uh, individual segment, I'm finding that I have actually no difference in motion in either flexion or in extension. So um, the restriction is present in both flexion and extension. How I am going to name that segment is now C3 neutral side bent right, rotated right, or I can say rotated right, side bent right. Um, and that would be my diagnosis for C3. Now, if I was moving up to uh, the AA joint or the atlantoaxial joint, um, I would bring my uh, fingers, instead of being directly on uh, C3, now I would move up to C2, and I could use C2 to monitor um, the axis or I could use uh, C2 to monitor that, uh, that segment while I bring my index fingers um, up by the mastoids just inferior and try to find the transverse processes of C1. So now in order to evaluate motion at the AA joint, I'm going to try to induce rotation of the atlas on the axis. So I can do that in just this supine position and induce rotation and then induce rotation. But that's difficult to uh, isolate the motion just to that segment. So what I can do is I can stand up and flex the cervical spine to try to engage the uncovertebral joints from C2 to C7, which will lock out those segments and then will allow me to isolate my motion to just the atlas on the axis. So try not to help me at all. And when I rotate to the left, decent motion. When I try to rotate to the right, um, I hit a barrier when I try to rotate to the right as well. I'm seeing a bit of a, a cervical, paraspinal, and um, uh, accessory muscle uh, muscles being engaged, uh, which indicates that um, that direction might be a little bit more uncomfortable. So with that preference in rotation to the left and a barrier in rotation to the right, I would diagnose that uh, segment as AA rotated left. Uh, for the AA, I'm not going to incorporate side bending at all. I'm also not going to worry about incorporating flexion or extension because the AA joint is primarily a rotation-based joint. Now moving up to the OA, I would scoop the occiput a little bit more and my uh, middle finger is going to come right into the occiput itself. My index finger again is going to come to uh, C1 transverse processes. In this instance, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be attempting to induce side bending and a little bit of rotation and then flexion and extension uh, of the occiput on the 
atlas, so C0 or the occiput on C1. So uh, with this contact here, my index fingers now become monitoring fingers where I'm monitoring uh, for motion at C1 and I'm going to be uh, inducing motion at the occiput. So translation is going to be my primary means for accomplishing this. So I translate to the left, which induces right side bending. Translate to the right, which induces left side bending. And what I'm finding is I have a lot more left side bending or a lot more translation to the right than I do to the left. So for the OA, I know that, again, Friad's principles do not apply, but for the OA, side bending and rotation are always uncoupled, so they're always uh, in opposite directions. So if I have a freedom of motion in side bending to the left, I'm going to have a freedom of motion in rotation to the right. And I could actually test that motion and pair those motions together, and I find that there is good motion with side bending to the left and rotation to the right at the occiput. Um, and when I try to side bend to the right and rotate to the left, I hit a bit of a barrier and I have a lot less motion. Now I would test again in flexion. So flexion here. And extension. And I find in flexion I have more symmetric motion in both directions. As a result, I'm going to name my somatic dysfunction as OA flexed, side bent left, rotated right. Okay, so now I'm going to demonstrate a real-time evaluation so you can get a sense of uh, what that flow and pace should be. So starting from the lower cervical spine, I'm going to start from C7 and I'm going to work my way up. I'm going to be translating and looking for any segments that have any significant restriction uh, all the way up to C2. And when I get to C3, I'm finding that there is greater freedom in translation to the right. Sorry, there's great, greater freedom in translation to the left and uh, more barrier when I try to translate to the right. So um, I have a freedom in right side bending and right rotation and I test in flexion, and I test in extension, and I find no difference, so my segment is C3, neutral, uh, rotated right, side bent right. Coming up to the AA, make my contact, and I'm gonna induce rotation, but first I'm gonna flex up to lock out the lower segments, and I'm gonna rotate to the left. Pretty good motion, rotate to the right, and and about here, I start feeling a barrier. So there's a restriction in rotation to the right, freedom in rotation to the left. That would tell me my somatic dysfunction is AA rotated left. Coming up to the OA. Again, same contacts, but with my middle finger on the occiput. I'm now going to translate. And I'm finding greater freedom with translation to the right. Inflection. I find greater symmetry in extension, more restriction, which suggests that my OA is flexed, side bent left, and rotated right. 